Thanks, Dan, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, this is a very unusual sort of talk, um, especially uh, to be given um, uh, by a philosopher. Uh, the great thing about being at the Benson Center is uh, tolerating uh, giving talks and uh, topics that um, are a little, a little unusual, that are uh, a little bit different uh, than one's standard fare. So 20th century politics was, you might say, um, a somewhat secular affair among elites. A lot of the fights were, should we have democracy or fascism or communism? Or should we have capitalism or socialism as our economic system? In many ways, the political expression of the great world religions was suppressed with the partial late 20th century exception of Islam. And a great many people thought that the age of religion and politics had mostly passed by. The very least people would learn to do as so many Christians have learned to do, to privatize their faith commitments, to keep them to themselves and out of the public square. 21st century politics has disappointed people who were hoping for another century of largely secular conflict. We've seen the rise of religiously infused politics across the great world religions. Catholicism, as we've seen in Poland and Hungary, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, as we see in Russia right now, um, religious conviction, I do believe, is partly driving um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There's a somewhat of a Confucian revival and Confucian thought in China, but also in its uh, diaspora uh, following communism. We have seen um, the Muslim world continuing to have uh, a variety of different expressions of political Islam. Actually, the range is, is really very, very broad um, the more you look into it. Uh, and um, perhaps the most surprising case of all to outsiders is the rise of Hindu nationalism in India. For a long time, it was seen as a secular democratic state. Um, but today, things uh, have changed a great deal, and they may continue to change a great deal more. My own view of what, why this has happened is that the 20th century was just an outlier in the history of the human race. For most of uh, human societies that we know of have had a religion, and they've had a politics. And in very many cases, those things were not sharply distinguished that the separation of religion and politics is something that is extremely historically unique, and it doesn't really matter how you understand politics or religion, that claim is still true. One of the things I think that left a lot of people worried about religion and politics um, less concerned is that Marxist socialist, but also non-Marxist socialist regimes found ways of suppressing the political expression of religion with more aggressive forms of secularization. But there's also sort of a, your own kind of secularization that you saw in Western Europe that wasn't forcibly imposed, but seemed to happen of its own accord. And that was not happening in the United States until the 21st century, but now seems to be occurring. So really it's the mixture of religion and politics that is the norm for the human race, uh, not separation. And one of the things that's happened as these doctrines have arisen in the great world religions once more is that they hearken back to previous eras where the great world religion was especially influential and they use it as a critique of liberal elites in the West and globally. So they say something along the following lines, look, our religion is true. And if our religion is true, why then it should be the dominant influence in politics? Of course it should, it's true. It tells us about things like ultimate meaning in life about morality, about uh, what comes after we die. And the problem is that liberals, people who say they believe in freedom and equality and treating everyone the same, are actually dishonest about this. In fact, they have a faith that is as much of a faith, a sectarian system of belief as anyone else. And these figures all across the world, and I'm reading people in Sunni Islam and Chinese Confucianism, in uh, Catholic anti-liberalism are making this argument. The liberal state is an ideological state and that all they want is to have an ideological state where the ideology is true. They see what's going on at the elite level, particularly in matters of sex and gender as absurd, uh, horrifying and utterly delegitimizing of uh, Western global elites. So what I've been interested in as a kind of liberal, kind of classical liberal, is and as a Christian, is to look at these doctrines from the inside. 
not to just dismiss these concerns as theocratic or bigoted, um, but rather to say, look, actually these theologies have a rich and profound history and they do provide interesting and important grounds for the critique of liberal order uh, that are worth exploring. And my book, All the Kingdoms of the World, focuses primarily on this doctrine of Catholic integralism, um, but it also examines uh, similar doctrines in Chinese Confucianism and in Sunni Islam. So that's what I'm after is to talk about the, these doctrines that I call in the book religious anti-liberalisms. They propose the coercive establishment of their faith and the suppression of certain traditional liberal institutions, um, in particular, uh, widespread universal freedom of religion. Now, one of the most interesting things about this phenomenon is that it has come largely from young people. Many young, particularly religious conservatives that see their older generation as uh, having given in to secular values and, and consumerism and any manner of uh, uh, seemingly morally corrupt behavior. And many young Christians are uh, concerned about liberal order in the United States, in Western Europe, and Eastern Europe, and a variety of different uh, places. You'd be surprised how broad this was. But what's interesting is to actually examine those who are prepared to say, yeah, let's do something totally different. There are people that call themselves post-liberals, most of which say there's something wrong with liberal order, but we don't really necessarily know what to replace it with. But there are some who call themselves post-liberals that I would call anti-liberals. They think they know what the alternative is and they want to take us there, at least many of them do. So we're going to examine one of these radical doctrines. Catholic integralism is a very online phenomenon as it stands, um, but it's a doctrine that spread among Catholic intellectual circles, among younger people, even in seminaries, different universities and law schools. Um, but it's a, a very big, it's a very big movement online. Uh, and it is, you know, a little unusual, um, but What's important to understand is this isn't just a kind of random thing. Uh, the doctrine that I'll talk about today was probably the dominant political theology in Latin Christendom between the 11th century and the, the Reformation, the 16th century. And in some places in Catholic Europe, it was the dominant political theology for much, much longer than that. Uh, it is a doctrine that Hobbes struggles with in Leviathan, uh, the back half, chapter 42 in particular. Um, Locke is concerned with a kind of Anglican equivalent in his exchanges with Jonas Brost. So this doctrine is not just some random thing that happened in the 21st century, but rather a revival of an intellectual tradition that was once extremely influential. So I'm going to define integralism today and raise a problem for it. I'm going to call this the justice argument. And it's going to claim that integralism permits unjust coercion of the baptized on its own ground. Now, when I talk to crowds about integralism, there's a very important thing to understand. Standard political philosophy is usually a story about the relationship between the individual and the nation state. If they're doing it well, it's between the individual, the state, and intermediary institutions, voluntary societies like firms, like uh, clubs, like churches, and so on. But integralism has, has a radically different methodology. It's what I'm going to call two-polity political theory. So for much of its history, the Catholic Church understood herself as a polity, and not merely owing to the fact that the Pope was an Italian sovereign in a variety of areas called the Papal States. Church has her own political structure, her own law, her own courts. And in much of the medieval period, her law was backed by the secular polity. That is the non-ecclesiastical polity. That's not to say that the state was secular, far from it. So the state is not the only polity in the in integralist political thought. The state is the earthly polity. The church is the heavenly polity. And here's a question that simply does not arise in contemporary political thought. Which polity is supreme? Because there's only one polity, properly speaking. It's defined by the state. This is why you don't often read medieval political philosophy in the canon. So always talking about the church. And so a lot of people think this is kind of like this needless complication and this question that we're not interested in anymore. Now, in this question, which polity is supreme, there are kind of two extreme positions. The one, which actually has very few defenders, we call hierarchy, where the Pope has great temporal power, perhaps, for instance, the power to make and unmake Christian kings at will. Again, not a lot of people defending this position. I do think some medieval uh, popes uh, thought, thought this, but there was pushback from theologians, even during their uh, pontificates. 
And then there was the more common position that we had in Eastern Orthodoxy with what we call Cesaropapism and in France, um, where a variety of theologians thought that the king had great ecclesiastical power, in particular the power to appoint bishops and to try clerical crimes in secular courts, which is a very big deal. And there were a huge amount of fights about what courts uh, clerics should be tried in. But some pursued a middle ground. When integralism arose, it was a moderate position. The church had a nobler end than the state, salvation. And so it was in that sense, the state superior, but God had given the state its own independent mission to govern the temporal common good, the general welfare on matters that concern natural affairs, food, health, foreign policy. These were the business of the state. And in fact, God directly charged the state with that. Not all political authority comes through the church. This isn't a pure theocratic position. This isn't the view that all political authority flows through the church, okay? The church does not have direct authority over the state. But owing to its nobler purpose, the church could deputize the state to enforce church law when that was thought to be necessary. So, for instance, the church would punish heretics for trial, apostates, people who were baptized but decided to leave the faith for one reason or another. Um, and they, in fact, there was a great deal of canon law governing how these particular courts uh, were to be conducted. Um, such trials still exist, but not, of course, with the backing of states. Um, and so the thought here was that the church could call the state to enforce its church law with punishments characteristic of the civil power, fines, floggings, imprisonment, and even for recalcitrant heretics uh, being burnt alive. And this is because if you want to understand how the medieval church understood heresy, I want you to take every category of horror that you know of, you know, uh, someone who is diseased, someone who is a terrorist, someone who is a racist, and roll them all up into one. And that's how medieval cultures thought of the heretic. The heretic was bad in every way. Every single nasty stereotype about a particular group, they're all rolled into one. Heretics were seen as a danger to the secular and spiritual domains. And so they had to be suppressed, rigorously eliminated. It's also extremely important that we cannot talk about this doctrine without facing the fact that um, regimes that were in the vicinity of Catholic integralism uh, tended to treat Jews very poorly. Uh, there was a certain special protection afforded for Jews vis-a-vis -vis other non-Christians. Um, but uh, the practice was seen to isolate Jews almost entirely from Christians so that they wouldn't pollute Christians with non-Christian ideas. It's very important to this, to this view that even if this is not part of the definition of integralism, it is worth reflecting um, on why precisely the Jews are treated so badly under these regimes. So let's formalize this. There's three conditions, two of which many, many people accept, but the third one is kind of odd. So here's the Here's the first condition. God authorizes the state to advance the natural common good of a community. So, God, so the idea is that this is a theocentric theory of political authority. But of course, many, many people believe that ultimately God is somehow the author or the authority of a regime, right? I mean, it's kind of a declaration of independence. I mean, this is not a, you know, at the very least you think that God creates people in the divine image, giving them natural rights. So at some point, the origins of political authority for even a great many people today originate in the divine, even if there's a variety of steps in between. And a focus on the common good is very standard. I mean, I even think the frontispiece to Locke's second treatise, or the two treatises rather, um, refer to the public interest, even though he's trashed as a, as a liberal by uh, many uh, integralists. Then there's supernatural authority, which I would say like just about everyone who believes in God thinks in one way or another. God authorizes the church, however you want to understand it, but in this case is a Catholic understanding, to advance the supernatural common good. What is that? Salvation. It's corporate salvation, union with God. And it's not something that necessarily has to wait until after you die. You could be union unified with God right now, through the sacraments, baptism, the Eucharist, confession, and so on. It's very important that the church is authorized to... Uh, serve, but also to discipline its members, and only its members. So it's, it's sometimes been Christian practice, but as far as I can tell, never Christian dogma that it's permissible to force people into the church. It's very important for what I'm going to talk about. So it's the baptized. Now comes the third condition, and this is a condition that integralists adopt, 
that was frequently held by popes, but today almost no Catholic theologian accepts. This I call the supernatural sovereignty condition. It's a little complex, but it's quite intuitive when you got it. So to advance the supernatural common good, the church can mandate state policies backed by civil penalties that advance the supernatural common good directly. That is, they can't say, well, you need food to go to mass. So we're gonna, we're gonna run agricultural policy. That wouldn't be listed. But when it comes to suppressing the spread of heresy, of banning certain books that might tempt and corrupt people spiritually, pornography or Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, all dangerous stuff uh, have to be restricted. Um, so that's essentially the idea. This is sometimes called the indirect power of the popes. It's the indirect temporal power. So it's not direct. It's power of everything. The greatest period of integralist thought was the Counter-Reformation, the great response to the Protestant Reformation um, that really begins with the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century. It produced a variety of important figures, but the two greatest integralist minds, I think, of any time were Francisco Suarez and Cardinal Robert Bellarmine. In fact, and Leviathan Hobbes takes uh, Bellarmine on at great length, um, finding his arguments to be making the very best case for an integralist regime against the sort of singular polity that Hobbes was for. And a very interesting thing happened. As you may know, there was a kind of moderate Catholic, Erasmus of Rotterdam, who was trying to take on certain insights for the Reformation, but remain within the church. And in his commentary in the Gospel of Matthew, he made a proposal. And it's kind of proto-liberal. He said, look, some people baptize by, you know, their godparents make promise to raise them in the church. But suppose when they reach the age of consent, they say, look, we don't accept our vows. Erasmus says, maybe we shouldn't subject them to civil penalties. Maybe we shouldn't put them in jail or flog them or whatever. Um, maybe we should just deny them access to sacraments. This is, in fact, the Catholic Church's position today, right? It doesn't try to direct the state to uh, punish apostates or heretics. The Parisian School of Theology, which was quite influential at that time, immediately censured him. And in fact, what they're doing is denying his dogma and advertising it. If anyone says that when they grow up, those baptized as little children should be asked whether they wish to affirm what their godparents promised in their name when they were baptized, usually as infants, or uh, uh, and that when they reply that they have no such wish, they should be left to their own decision and not in the meantime be coerced by any penalty into the Christian life, except that they be barred from the reception of the Eucharist and the other sacraments until they have a change of heart, let him be anathema. So I had to explain it because they did it in a sentence. It was sort of complicated. But basically, here's the idea. You're baptized. You grow up, you're 14. You say, I no longer accept this. Erasmus says, let's not put him in jail. You know, let's not subject him to civil penalties. Let's not do that. We could say you can't, can't receive Holy Communion, okay, but let's not put him in prison. Parisian school said this is heretical. It's critical that baptism alone makes one a citizen of the church. No adult consent required once you're baptized, unless you were an adult and baptized against your will, in which case it would be invalid. This is very important for the talk. It's very important to understand that the reason, one reason they were on about this is because they didn't want to deny baptism's power. Another reason they were on about this, I think, is that if they allowed this, a whole bunch of people would go Protestant <laughs> um, because Protestants have the same um, uh, ba baptismal uh, words, right? Which are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the only sacrament, I think, outside of the, the Protestants, uh, Catholics think that Protestants have. So very important for my argument. Baptism makes one a citizen of the church, and integralists argue that this is actually irreformable dogma because the Council of Trent itself elevated this censure into a canon. So the integralists argue that this actually positions irreformable. Even the vast majority of Catholics I talked to have never heard of it. This is actually their best piece of dogmatic evidence. They've got a variety of other arguments they've made, but this is actually the best argument they have. This condition continued to be understood in more or less this way, even as the church became unable to enforce laws against heresy and apostasy outside of the papal states, and even then they didn't do it too much. But it was still seen in one way or another as the ideal, the best regime, the thing to be aimed at. All the way down to Pope Leo XIII, whose pontificate, if I recall, was from 1878 to 1903. He's also the most prolific of the popes, wrote over 88 encyclicals. The one most people have heard of is Rerum Novarum, which kicked off the codification of Catholic social thought. 
Um, so if you've heard of papal encyclicals on political, economic, and moral matters, there's a, a way in which uh, Leo XIII sort of gave the most energy to this. He has an encyclical Immortale Dei, which is his political theology. Um, and he says this, he says, the Almighty therefore has given the charge of the human race to two powers, the ecclesiastical and the civil, the one being set over divine, the other over human things. Each in its own kindness, each in its kind is supreme. Each has fixed limits within which it is contained, limits which are defined by the nature and special province of each. Okay, those are the first two conditions of integralism, the natural authority condition, supernatural authority condition. And then there's this, people dispute the interpretation. He says, there must accordingly exist between the two powers a certain orderly connection, which may be compared to the union of the soul and body and man, by which he means the church is the soul and the state is the body. So on this doctrine of the soul, the state has certain, or the, the body has certain natural functions, digestion, breathing, um, but that the, the sort of noblest part of the person, the eternal soul is the one that animates the body, that gives it its point, its purpose. And some people have thought that this is um, Leo endorsing the supernatural sovereignty condition, or at least coming close to it. Depends on how literally you think he's using this soul body analogy. By the 20th century, by the middle of the 20th century, the Catholic Church is wanting to move away from this position decisively. Part of this has to do with the fact that the church wants to be part of the post-war international order. And that involves being part of the UN and Declaration of Human Rights, or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which includes religious freedom. There are a lot of people who are worried in particular that the Catholic Church says, no, look, we're going to limit religious liberty while we're in power, but not when we're out of power, that that would be inconsistent. And in fact, that it put Catholics in danger from non-Catholic states um, where they existed because the thought would be people would say Catholics were a fifth column. I mean, people said that when Kennedy ran, right? We said that for a long time. So they want to push back on this. Now, there are many factions in the Catholic Church that have grown quite liberal theologically, socially, economically, politically. And they wanted to radically modernize the church. They had some success, particularly in the form of worship, a variety of other uh, issues. Um, there's a lot of dispute about how to understand Vatican II, the authority of its doctrines, what came out of it. Many Catholics that are conservative are quick to condemn what they call the spirit of Vatican II, um, but not its documents. But its most controversial decision was on religious liberty, a doctrine known as Dignitatis Humanae, or that I will refer to as the age. Here's what DH says. This Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all men are to be immune from coercion. All men are to be immune from coercion on the part of individuals or of social groups or of any human power. In such wise that no one, no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone or in association with others within due limits. It's not like integralism to me. And they don't just give practical reasons for this. They give moral reasons. The council further declares that the right of religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person, as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. The right of the human person to religious freedom is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed, and thus it is to become a civil right. These liberties include worship, organization, education, parents' rights, press, speech, and so on. Looks like figures like Pius IX, Leo XIII, and integralism in general were set aside. And in fact, that is how the vast majority of Catholics understood it. So the church would embrace constitutional democracy and universal human rights as a matter of what we might call its official theology, even if you don't think it's technically dogma. Many conservative Catholics had and continue to have grave reservations about the council. But the remaining integralists felt that DH forced them to take an oppositional stance towards Vatican II and church leadership. From World War II into the 21st century, liberal democratic order went from strength to strength. It seemed to uh, triumph over all its competitors and the church accumulated cultural losses, but the seeming discontinuity remained. Starting about 15 years ago, a philosopher at uh, actually King's College London, Catholic philosopher Thomas Pink, a leading scholar of the counter-reformation political theory, especially Suarez, he felt that the official theology of Vatican II accommodated modernity too much. And he seeks to persuade the Catholic Church to reconcile with its past. Here, unlike many of uh, the Twitter and the uh, his goal was not, say, 
getting the US to be a bit more like Hungary, um, but rather church renewal. What Ping did to open the door to integralism is he offered a new interpretation of dignitatis humanity. He says, yes, dignitatis humanity declares as a matter of natural law and revelation, a transcendent right of religious freedom against the state. It's silent though, on any right of religious freedom against the church. Of course, the church may use spiritual punishment such as excommunication, so on to maintain its mission. Who would deny that? And here's the big move. DH is also silent on another power of the church. The power of the church to deputize the state to help enforce church law. Now you may say, no, 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 no. The state can never use religious coercion and so the church can't authorize it to do something it has no right to do. And on Pink's interpretation, that's just not so. The state has no natural authority over religion because in fact, Christ's life, death and resurrection have led that the church to take religion out of the hands of the state so that it entirely transcends state power. But Dignitas Humani says nothing about the church's capacity to authorize the state to do some of, but not think does not endorse, of course, anything like punishments used at that time. Um, but that in principle, there were certain kind of punishments that would be legitimate in an ideal order. He says integralism is no longer church policy. Dignitatis Humani changed that, but policies can change. For centuries, Pink says the church saw herself as a coercive authority. Part of facing up to the church's past is to reconcile this fact. Meanwhile, the American culture war raged. The church faced its own uh, self-inflicted wounds, yet Catholics ascended to the height of elite influence. Young Catholic intellectuals of a conservative bent increasingly feel betrayed by liberal democratic order. Few anticipated that traditional Catholics would face social stigma over their beliefs on sex and gender, but this is what has happened at, at least some uh, elite parts of American society. Some suggested that hostility to the church was baked into liberal democratic order all along. Catholics would have to pursue a more radical alternative. So what's happened in the last 10 years is this. Particularly uh, a man, uh, Father Edmund Walsh, a Cistercian monk, son of renowned Catholic theologians, uh, attended one of Pink's le lectures. He'd long felt that traditionalists were too hostile to the church as she is, but Dignitatis Humani stood in the way of reconciling Catholicism with its pre-modern past. Pink solved Father Edmund's problem. Here's what Pink did for Father Edmund. Many of his friends who founded a variety of publications, published a number of books, and created a great deal of online buzz that's reached uh, into uh, major uh, newspapers uh, discussing this in popular culture. They made it possible for Catholics to oppose liberal order while remaining in their minds loyal sons and daughters of the church. So if you were dissatisfied with liberal order and you're a Catholic, Dignitatis Humani no longer stands in your way. Even if you know that this interpretation is a minority view, it opened the door. And it turned out there are a great many people, especially many Amer young American Catholics that said, our society is corrupt from top to bottom. That includes its doctrine of church and state. And now I know that my, my church, my faith, no longer puts a barrier in the way of my opposition to liberalism. See, the intellectual demand was there. Pink was the supply. I won't go through all of this except to say that things really took off in 2016 with uh, the election of Donald Trump, but also the conversion of Harvard Law School's uh, Adrian Vermeule to Catholicism and his open endorsement of integralism. Vermeule's work focuses on transitional questions, so I'm just not going to talk about him here. American integralists all adopted Pink's interpretation pretty much. So you can't have forced baptism, but if the church could readopt integralist policy and a new and powerful Catholic state could be constructed, a reunification could occur. That this is the best regime. And even if it's very far away and infeasible, it's what Catholics should hope for politically. In such a state, the baptized will be treated differently than the unbaptized, as we do see in some Islamic states where Muslims are treated differently um, than non-Muslims. Again, the relationship's not unlike the application of Sharia law to Muslims and Islamic societies, which many believe includes physical punishment for apostasy. This isn't a completely theocratical vision. Religious liberty for the unbaptized, for Jews and Muslims and so on, would be extensive, ideally, anyway. 
But, and these the American integralists say, ultimately the American state would be coercively Catholic. A liberal faith, as they would call it, would be conquered and subdued under Catholic leadership. This tends to be what the way the Americans talk, though, not, not paint. So here's the key thing for us to reflect on. The entire integralist project depends on a single moral claim. Baptism must transform religious coercion from just to unjust. You may not forcibly baptize someone. You cannot use religious coercion against the unbaptized under any circumstances. That's part of Pink's read of Dignus Hadas Humanae. Once you're within the church, though, things are different. But it's baptism that we can call a normative or moral transformer. It is to be baptized that makes one subject to, in an ideal polity, in an integralist polity, would make you subject to civil penalties if you committed an ecclesiastical crime and were found guilty of it in a canonical court. This is pretty puzzling, though. It's Catholic doctrine that we have moral reason to oppose forced baptism, decisive moral reason, decisive moral reason. That's a matter known by reason and revelation. You must never, ever, ever forcibly baptize anyone. The natural thought is surely those same reasons apply to people baptized as infants. You baptize an infant, they grow up, say, nobody knows they were baptized. They grow up Muslim or they grow up Jewish, they grow up Hindu. At least it looks like integralists have to say, well, you were validly baptized as an infant, you're subject to church law. Now, of course, you couldn't be convicted of a canonical crime because you wouldn't be culpable. So you may not get punished. And in fact, many of the more sophisticated integrals will say, yeah, I mean, yeah, these people will probably be found innocent. I kind of think, well, maybe some of them wouldn't be. <laughs> um, that would be a concern. But this is the thing to which the integralists are committed, particularly with their reading of the Council of Trent. Okay? They say that that's dogma. Okay? Baptism makes one a citizen of the earth, the heavenly polity, period. Period. So the same, and to those who no longer believe, some say someone loses their faith, perhaps because they were mistreated by the church. Doesn't matter. You're a citizen of the church. Baptism made you a citizen of the church. Baptism is an indelible mark on the soul. It is an ontological transformation of the person that no one can undo or affect. At any point in space or time, it is a divine act. You cannot leave the church, really. Your baptism cannot be undone. There's no expatriation from the church. It's impossible. So Catholics say baptism involves a massive ontological change in the person. Sin is forgiven. The supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and love are implanted. And the will has the capacity to unite with God. My view, however beautiful and powerful baptism may be, nothing about it explains why it should legitimize religious violence. Here's a standard line that I hear sometimes. Baptism is just second birthright citizenship. Right? You're born again, you acquire new citizenship, but it's just like being born in this country and acquiring citizenship in the state. You're subject to state law. In the case of baptism, you're subject to church law. There's an analogy. One becomes a citizen of the church, subject to all the rights and responsibilities thereof. Trouble is, that simply defers answering the question. The state bestows citizenship by convention. Baptism bestows citizenship necessarily. The state could change its convention. You say, well, why do we have birthright citizenship? You say, well, that's the law. The law can change. You can't say that in the case of baptism. Aquinas actually saw the tension in the 13th century, and his solution was to point to baptismal vows. Vows must be made voluntarily, but then they can be enforced. So if baptism is a kind of vow or involves a vow or is like a vow in some way, then it could be enforced once it was made. Now, remember the Trent canon, even infant baptism makes one of the citizen, a citizen of the church. But infants make no vow. Baptism may change the will, Catholic Church teaches, but it does not cause a choice. The Parisian censure makes clear in a way that the Trent Canon does not, um, that the godparents make the vow. 
So if you're baptized as an infant, you become subject to ecclesiastical and civil censure because your godparents made a promise on your behalf. Now, this would make sense if you made the promise yourself. You say, well, look, I promised to be under the church or whatever. But maybe that's, you know, that makes sense, right? But let's accept that A's promise can make B a citizen. You might think that's a little odd, but sometimes we allow people to make a vow on the behalf of somebody else. Of course, in lots of cases, we don't allow it at all. <laughs> um, but it's not, it's not as absurd as it may seem. But let's ask this question. Is the vow necessary for citizenship in the church? If it is necessary, baptism is insufficient. The whole point of the Trinitine teaching was to ensure that baptism retained its power. It was a weakened baptism. It also disincentivized the vow. I mean, if you're godparents and you say, uh-oh, what if this little baby grows up and they want to be Muslim or they want to be Jewish? If I don't make these vows, they can't be punished by the state. If I do make the vows, they can be. Maybe I won't make them. Maybe I'll find a priest that will baptize them anyway. If the vow is not necessary, however, baptism should be sufficient on its own. The vows won't explain anything. So the vows are necessary to make one a citizen of the church. Baptism is weakened. If they are not necessarily, necessary, what do they add in terms of moral explanation? This is, I think, the problem with what Aquinas is dealing with in the, this article, and actually a few other places in the Summa, scattered. So for the integral the church is a polity, and the integral state is what we call a diarchical polity, a diarchy as it is sometimes called. Perhaps we can adopt theories of political obligation, that is obligations to obey the state, to solve this baptism puzzle. So we look at theories of obligation to obey the secular state, maybe they transfer and help to justify obligations, enforceable obligations to the heavenly polity. Here are the main options, and I can't go through them all. Hypothetical consent, gratitude, fair play, associative duties, and natural duties. These are the main besides actual consent, which we already dealt with because we're talking about vows, um, for the theories of political obligation that exist in contemporary political philosophy. I found Aquinas' account uh, unattractive, so I just thought, well, I'll just go through these theories and see if they can be adapted. Integrals are going to reject hypothetical consent to them that's too liberal. I think fair play theories, without explaining to you what they are, but I can, uh, resemble gratitude. And so I think actually gratitude is one of their best options. Natural duties of justice here, as say, for instance, Rawls's foundation for a political obligation aren't, aren't at stake because these, the baptismal vows or obligations aren't one that you owe to others in their status as persons because baptism is something that happens to a person. Okay, So you can't use the natural duty theory of justice. I'm going to not say more about this. You might be able to construct a parallel with what we might call natural duties of religion, but it doesn't work. So I'm just going to go through two potential solutions here before I end. Here's a gratitude theory of obligation. I, I mean, this is, I don't think this works, but it, it's interesting. Baptism, if again, for the purposes of this talk, accepting Catholicism is true, it bestows an infinite benefit. An infinite benefit. Now, this isn't to say that infants on Catholic dogma go to hell if they aren't baptized. This is what the old medieval doctrine of limbo was for. Um, but now the thought is that, of course, they go to heaven. Um, nonetheless, um, it, it does reduce, baptism does reduce your downside risk. <laughs> and, and it does so uh, to an, an infinite degree because it lasts forever. Um, suppose even that there are levels of heaven and everyone goes to some level and baptism raises you up a level. Even that has infinite value, right? Because you're on a better level for it. You've got some kind of Dante vision, but of course that's not what Dante would say, but nonetheless, we should be grateful for this. And baptism is what bestows it. And so the fact that baptism is what we should be gracious for could provide an obligation because it provides an infinite benefit. And we should reciprocate for an infinite benefit. We should be grateful to the church. But how does gratitude explain why the baptized may be forced to obey the integralist state? How, does, how would this work? Well, God has to make a determination that the baptized and integralist uh, polity must reciprocate gratitude by obeying the integralist state. Because, of course, duties of gratitude are often imperfect, right? And they're oftentimes vague. You say, look, I did you a good turn. Find some way to help me in return, right? That's an obligation. Someone helps you. You find a way to help Right? But there's nothing specific 
about that. The duty of gratitude isn't made precise. Now, it might be the case that if you care about the person who benefited you, you're going to want to benefit them in a way that's special to them, something that means something to them, right? Someone gives you a gift, you have to be thoughtful and give them a gift in return. But we don't actually have very much of any evidence that God has made this determination in scripture or uh, tradition, at least with respect to this is the way that God wants us to reciprocate gratitude. Scripture talks about this, about helping others and so on, forgiving others when you're forgiven, um, but this kind of reciprocation is left out. The standard forms of reciprocation are actually there, right? You're forgiven, so you, you forgive and so on. So there have to be some determination made by God that this was the only acceptable way to reciprocate gratitude for one's salvation. But why would one think this unless one were already an integralist? That is, what independent grounds would one give to think that God had made this determination unless one already accepted that integralism was true? And I couldn't figure out anything here. Also, we often don't think duties of gratitude can be enforced, but that's just a problem for gratitude theories in general. So just forget about that for a So what I'm suggesting here is I don't think the gratitude theory ends up moving the dialectic or the argument forward. I'm not saying that there's a formal fallacy here of begging the question, okay? All I'm saying here is that I think it would be really hard to bring over a non integralist on the basis of a gratitude theory, because you would have to say that yes, gratitude, and this is how God wants you to reciprocate the benefit. And then someone says, why? <laughs> what else are the integralists gonna say? Well, because integralism is true. Another theory that I think is helpful here, illuminating, or associative theories. Associative theories say that one acquires enforceable duties simply in virtue of being a member of the polity. So they oftentimes analogize these with familial duties, right? You have duties to your parents, your parents have duties to children, not because they consented to them. They just come with the territory of being a father, being a son, mother, or daughter. In the same way, secular theorists, associative theorists say, you're born into a country, you're a member, and with membership comes certain rights and responsibilities. And here's what the integralists might say. One becomes a member of the church through baptism, and the relations with other Christians are more intimate than the family. One becomes a member of the body of Christ. A couple of problems. Associative duties weaken if you can't expatriate. Right? What a lot of associative theorists say, yeah, if you're a member of the association, you're born into it then you have the obligations, but they don't say you can't leave. The question here though is baptism you can't undo. Um, and you might think that weakens the kind of associative duties that could be established because I think associative duties are most plausible when you can dissociate because you think, well, okay, you're associating, you're kind of going along with it. Whereas in the case of baptism, that's just not relevant because you aren't the one that changed you with baptism, God changed you. But the bigger problem is, say you don't buy that, is the problem of evil organizations. We don't have obligations to obey institutions whose leaders harm us. But baptism holds regardless of harmful behavior from church leadership. There's a kind of striking problem here. that if you're massively mistreated by church or state, it might be illicit for this church or state to punish you, um, but you would still be on a duty, under a duty to go along with it, and that seems intuitively wrong. But suppose you don't buy that. I actually think there's an even uh, more fundamental problem. Um, my problem with associative theories in general is they really don't explain political obligation. They just beg off of giving an explanation. Because you can always ask the question, okay, yeah, you're a member of the polity and have duties to it, but associative theorists are essentially saying and nothing more could be said than that. And so you can just say, yeah, you're a member of the church, and so you have these duties. That's just part of what it means to be a member or something. Now, that claim's not analytic. It's not true by definition. So what are the grounds for it? And you can say, nope, that's the ground level of explanation. Associative duties, whether they're the state or the church, give on obligations. That's just the ground level, ground floor moral principle. Um, but then again, we run into a similar problem that we were into with the gratitude theory, which is that integrals can't move the argument forward. They have no way to explain their most controversial commitment to non-integralist Catholics, right? So the integralist says, yeah, you should be an integralist because when you are a member of the church and the church is in the right union with the state, 
The church has deputized the state and you live under that state. And so you're under church authority, including the risk of civil penalties. And the non-Catholic says, yeah, I'm a member of the church. Why should I think that my association in the church has these implications? And then you're going to enter another series of arguments about dogma, for instance, like the Council of Trent. So the associative duties didn't actually help get us any closer to solving this problem. So I think gratitude and associative theories are interesting, um, but my ultimate worry about them is that they don't really move the ball forward in terms of explaining what's really going on, explaining why baptism transforms religious coercion from unjust to just. There's another solution, which I'll leave um, behind, uh, but here's a sort of thought. Political philosophers began crafting the familiar, uh, familiar theories of political obligation for one polity political theories. This is what a huge amount of the contemporary literature on political obligation was meant to do, and our duties to the state. We don't have to dig too deeply to see that modern theories of political obligation are going to struggle to explain a two polity political theories authority. I've given this talk a few different times, and it, uh, I have found that particularly in their writings, contemporary integralists haven't offered any resolution of the baptism dilemma. I actually think they would probably default to Aquinas. Um, but I think the baptismal vow stuff just really doesn't work for infants. Um, <coughs> so I just thought I would suggest some options. Maybe there are better options. A um, uh, piece that this talk is based on is coming out in political studies where I list some of the others. Happy to share a draft if you'd like to take a look at it. I, um, I can still change things at this late hour. Um, but here's how I'll conclude, this is a, something Mark Murphy suggested to me, I'll, I'll skip it, even though Mark's a great philosopher. So I conclude that it's not obvious that baptism, it's far from obvious, it seems false that baptism is a normative transform. Does not seem like baptism transforms coercion from unjust to just. So the integralist has to say, again, one may never force someone into the church. It is always impermissible to use religious coercion on the unbaptized. But once one's baptized, it's permitted. And it's baptism that makes that change. They need some story. They need some story. And the only story of any kind of official quality I could find, because the Parisian censure, the Council of Trent, I can't read the proceedings. So I don't really know what their, um, how the argument was conducted. The people I've read who talk about it, I don't get an account of what the actual argument was. Um, although I've suggested, I, you know, one is, not to weaken the power of baptism and the other, of course, is <laughs> you're in the counter-reformation. You don't want people baptized to become Protestants. I think that was a, a political consideration. Uh, so I just don't see how baptism is functions as a moral transformer, but the integralist needs that to be the case. And let me see just a few things by way of uh, finishing up. Establishing integralism requires a wild reversal of the Catholic Church's self-understanding. Its move away from integralism was, when it came, a long time coming. Um, integralism had not been politically feasible for centuries. This was especially true following the Napoleonic Wars. Um, it just wasn't on the table. And um, the Catholic Church um, is just not where the church is. There's not one. Mm, the Catholic Church is a billion members. Okay? It's 5,600 bishops. Not one of them is openly integralist. There are some guesses that maybe four or five of them might be uh, shy integralists, maybe. But Pope Francis described integralism as a plague. And that's because in uh, Latin America and in certain uh, parts of Europe, like Spain and Portugal, integralism is associated with fascism um, because many of the integralists were uh, Francoist. Um, and in fact, the previous generation of American integralists, Brent Bazell and uh, try up some of uh, his magazine that he split off from National Review Triumph magazine, uh, moved to Spain under Franco. Um, so integralism is this. So, you know, Fran Pope Francis is Argentinian, and he's, uh, so he's described integralism as a plague, but I actually, I don't know if it's because of the specific details of integralist dogma or just because he sees integralism as a kind of fascism. I'm not sure why, but nonetheless, <laughs> the Pope thinks your view is a plague. And 5,600 of your bishops, which is all of them, uh, think that your view is off the table. That's a problem. That's a problem. Another problem is this. I just don't see how that level of religious uniformity 
where you're able to use force against even baptized Protestants. I mean, think about this. If an integralist regime were to arise, every baptized Protestant will become in a certain way a criminal, if not a culpable one. To reestablish integralism, effectively the Catholic Church has to declare <laughs> hundreds of millions of Protestants uh, uh, criminals. Not, again, that they could be punished. They could be tried, and many would be found innocent because their family has been Protestant for 500 years and have done anything different. <laughs> but the idea that the Catholic Church is going to readopt this when it is a global church trying to engage with and interface every culture in the world, Imagine it coming to power. For instance, if you have a democracy and there's competitive parties, competitive elites, and there's trading off between those elites, it's extremely hard to imagine integralism being stable. And there's some interesting evidence for this, which is that the, the popes tried to depose, in a few cases succeeded, deposing kings. They've never tried to do that with a democratically elected leader. And the reasons are pretty plain. They're authorized by the people, at least in a certain kind of way. Um, before the church would say, well, the king is baptized, so he's under the authority of the church, so we'll just, just depose him. Um, but that's not how presidents and prime ministers work. And I think the only, only really stable way to establish it would be to go to some kind of monarchy again. Um, and many integralists are, in fact, monarchists, um, though some prominent integralists have told me they prefer a kind of mixed republic. Um, with a constitutionally uh, restrained monarch um, and competitive election. Um, nonetheless, for the Pope to have constitutionalized the supernatural sovereignty condition is really quite striking. I mean, you think about it, right? You, you, you've got the Pope in Vatican City, and he and his bishops are going to be able to make a claim about ordinary public policy in a modern nation state. And suppose most people are Catholics, but there are many who aren't. Um, they have ordinary rights to vote, ordinary political rights. Um, trying to imagine that actually stick in anything like a democratic order these today and under modern conditions of pluralism, just pretty implausible. And this is why I think that integralists have been perpetually drawn um, to dictatorial regimes, because this is really only ever going to come back under a dictatorial system. So it's just too much pluralism. There's too much disagreement even within the church. These days, the most wonderful and smartest Catholics I know all disagree sharply about as, about as much as possible. Um, even imagining the church being on the same page on this. I mean, think about it like this. You would have to convert enough bishops that they would elect an integralist pope. The integralist pope would have to decide that it is currently wise and feasible in order to reestablish polity. The leader of a secular state would have to be prepared to spit to the pope, and they would have to, at the same time, be able to form some kind of contract that would allow this to come to be. And the feasibility problems are absolutely ludicrous, um, and that's something I talk about in the book. Now, many of them have said to me, we don't care about feasibility. We're just interested in the ideal theory. We're just interested in the best. I think that's a very interesting claim, and that's what I focus most on in the book. I think it's false in part because the ideal regime would be unjust, <laughs> because it would uh, uh, treat baptism as a norm of transformer, and it isn't. So in diverse and complex societies, integralism will be stabilized, but a central problem, central problem is its injustice. The church would mistreat its own one. So, you know, there I'll, I'll end, but just to say this, um, I actually think there are similar problems um, within other religious anti-liberal systems. For instance, I think even with contemporary Sunni Islamic political theology, there's a real problem of the unequal, unequal treatment of citizens um, that comes up. And so in the book, I talk about how the arguments I give against integralism have parallels um, in other anti-liberal political theologies. Um, and so this is my attempt to kind of reason from within the faith, taking all the faith's conditions on, but then trying to see, do these anti-liberalisms hold up? I think they don't, but uh, it takes a bit of doing to see it. So thank you all. Thank you, Kevin. We'll have a Q&A session um, for both uh, our live audience and the virtual audience. To the virtual audience, you can ask questions by scrolling down to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, clicking that, and typing in your question. Um, so I'll, I'll go back and forth. Yeah. So, so it, it strikes me that you're like, 
I mean, you are trying to take them very seriously, but at the end of the day, wouldn't they just say, we don't care that you think that it's unjust? I mean, like, I mean, that's a, it's an unserious response, I think, but also like, you, you, you're, you, I think, while coming at it from within the system is kind of a thing a liberal would do, um, and I think they don't care. So like, like, I mean, don't, I mean, I, I, I'm just, I'm, can, it, I, I feel like there's like a tension in your methodology, <laughs> um, or at least there's a tension in your methodology that could possibly be compelling to the people who are, 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 are possibly in most need of convincing. So this gets into the sociology of the movement. And I find there's a very sharp divide between American integralists and non-Americans. The non-American integralists in England or France or what have you, they're so much further away from even having this conversation that um, a lot of them are interested in this for genuinely intellectual reasons. So you really can talk to them. And there are, I think, a number of American uh, uh, Catholic integralists who are as well. The problem is the most prominent American Catholic integralists may well uh, give, give your response because I think they, they've spent so much effort trying to normalize, say, Viktor Orban and Orbanist policies, some of them saying nice things about the Chinese Communist Party's tactics. They very well may well react the way that you suggest. But I know a lot of integralists now, and many of them I do think are sincerely convicted. A lot of it really comes from the idea that liberal neutrality, the neutrality of liberal state is a lie. It's not just false, it's not just impossible, it's a lie, it's deception. And for that reason, they think, look, we may be really far away from getting the true view in power, but we should have the true view in power instead of this pernicious, poisonous, false view. Um, and I think for many of them, that's the sort of essence of it. It's that liberal order is corrupt, it's hypocritical, um, it's authoritarian, and why should we restrain ourselves from going to institutionalize the truth? Um, to institutionalize the whole human good, to have a polity that actually helps people to salvation rather than allowing them to be tempted in every possible way without any assistance or help at all. So that's what they say. Um, but there are definitely some, I think, that are very eager uh, for political power. And there are rumblings within the integralist community suggesting a pushback uh, against those, some of those efforts. And I, I wish those integralists all the best. Uh, yeah. So it strikes me that when, when people form extreme religious groups, it seems like one option is authoritarian bents to try to basically bring the society into your rule, and the other instinct is separatism. Are there any integral, integralist separatists? No, because the point of integral, I mean, the point of integralism is to not give the liberal state free reign. Because on their view, the liberal state is so toxic, it's so poisonous and dangerous that um, you can't just withdraw. So this is their critique of like Rod Ver, Benedict Option type moves. Is they, this is what Vermeule says in his review of Pat Deneen's book, Why Liberalism Failed. And I actually think Deneen's next book, Regime Change, is essentially agreeing with Vermeule, which is that the liberal state is too poisonous. And so integralists essentially have to take it over and transform it um, because the decentralization and withdrawal strategy will just fail. I think that's false. I actually think the Amish are doing the best they've ever done. I actually think the, the religious groups that have done, or, you know, the Haredi Jews, I mean, like, they're, 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 what, what did I tell when I was, when I was talking to some of them, they're a third of Brooklyn school children now. Um, actually, the withdrawal communities, uh, because of demographic reasons in part, are actually flourishing. Um, so I actually think the integralists are wrong about this, but this is what they, many of them will tell you. They'll tell you, liberal state's too toxic, and so it has to be transformed. Um, so you can't just withdraw the state of destroy. Um, let me take a, a question from the virtual audience and try to connect it uh, uh, to talk a bit too. Um, the question is, do you think nationalism or patriotism is replacing our need for a spiritual guide? And, and I, let me just add to that maybe a little bit. Um, from the perspective of the integralists, yeah. um, do they think that there's something in our um, in our liberal polity that has replaced this or has it aspires to yes. yes and 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 for integralists um, it, it's a variety of things for the left they say it's gender and uh, sex ideology uh, social justice type stuff for the right they say it's capitalism it's worship worship of the market 
They think both are the left and the right worshiping the wrong kind of freedom, um, negative freedom or freedom as autonomy, when the real freedom is theonomous, is to be in submission to God um, and to have one's soul ordered by God, the divine, drawn on Plato in a certain way there. Freedom really is being is the, the life of virtue. Um, but this question actually probably came up because the person um, recognizes that there's this complex interplay between the integralists themselves and the new nationalist right, um, which is led by a number of people like Yoram Hazoni, who is a, a Jewish philosopher um, who's just written a, a book called Conservatism, a Rediscovery. Um, and they run these conferences, the, the, they're called NatCon, the Nationalist Conferences. And They've put out a variety of political documents, and a lot of it's trying to kind of systematize what they see as kind of good in Trumpism and leaving out what's bad. Um, and the integralists used to be kind of uh, get along with the new national strike, but uh, um, from Twitter, Hazoni made it clear they boycotted the last one. Um, and part of it is because some of them are not nationalists. What they want is an international Catholic empire. They want Christendom, right? Latin Christendom which was a multinational uh, uh, spiritual empire on their view. So nationalism, they say, is good as a way to resist liberalism, but nationalism can become its own idol. And so that's why ultimately you have to go to integralism. So the cool thing, at least, is that from their perspective, nationalism, patriotism can be good as a way of saying, no, liberalism, you're wrong, that all and only those relationships that are chosen are the valuable ones. I mean, those of you who saw Maloney's, some of Maloney, uh, new Prime Minister Maloney's, uh, Prime Minister yet? Um, Italians, my goodness. Um, <laughs> so, um, but she, she gave, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of what the nationalists say, the new nationalists say, what a lot of communitarians said for a long time, is that there are valuable relationships that we have, roles that we have, that were unchosen unchosen. And the liberalism says the only valuable relations are the ones that are chosen. Now that's false, but nonetheless, that's the thought. So the question for the integralist, I think, is how should they greet um, nationalism? Um, how should they react to it? And, and I think they, they have said, like, well, it's probably good as a bulwark against the left, um, but ultimately it would have to be uh, replaced because it too could become an idol. So that's, yeah. So it's actually, there's been actually some really interesting online discussion about the, uh, whether Christians can accept nationalism or not. Um, so. Yeah, two points. One, I think minor to your argument and one perhaps more interesting from your perspective. Um, the minor one is that, you know, historically 20th century Europe is full of Christian democratic parties, that's right. Catholic parties, mm -hmm. et cetera. So at no point has religion or even Catholicism been absent from European politics That's correct. in the 20th century. So I would not put it quite as strongly as you did at the very least in the, in the opening of your fair, discussion. Fair. But the other thing is, it seems to me there's a, a fairly common sense kind of argument about there being no right of exit from baptism. Uh, and it's found certainly among Orthodox Jews. For an Orthodox Jew, no matter what you do, you can never cease to be a Jew. You can refer to Catholicism, doesn't matter. You're still a Jew. Why? Because you're still part of the family. If you have a brother who was kidnapped and taken away, he is still your brother. And so if you were baptized and kidnapped the next day by a Muslim family and raised as Muslims, doesn't matter. You are still part of the Christian family that you, in fact, the Catholic family that you joined when you were baptized. And so this is precisely one of those associations which you didn't choose, mm -hmm. uh, just as you don't choose your family. And which stick with you forever, despite your best efforts to leave them. Won't that work? Well, that's a version of the associative one. So the question is, why is it the case that one's membership in this particular organization comes with the specific rights and duties that the integral think that it does? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's entirely plausible that as a, it's a general truth that not all of our obligations to others are chosen. That's trivial, in my view. Um, but the, the interesting question is about how this works as a matter of the authority of the state. The best way to make the suggestion work is you have to add another argument. And um, you could say, for instance, look, you're an associative member of the church. And then there's this interesting question. Can the church authorize the state 
to enforce its law. Because you might say, well, look, I mean, yes, I'm obligated to do what the church says, but that doesn't speak to the question of whether the church can authorize the state. And then I have to do what the state says with respect to these things. And in fact, the more conservative Catholics have said to me that they think, yeah, we have associative duties to the church, but the church can't authorize the state because religious coercion is a violation of natural law. So what's often said with the associative with the associative case is, um, yeah, there are associative duties to the church. That's true. They just can't be legally enforced. Um, and then, of course, the argument um, actually starts to get pretty interesting um, because it has to do with the conditions under which the church can delegate a power that it can't exercise. Because the church isn't supposed to use physical force. Now, there are people like Pink who says, actually, the church can use physical coercion if it wanted, but it's not competent to. So that's why God authorized the state to do it. I actually think that doesn't that argument doesn't work because even though the papal states were poorly run, the church did show to some extent an ability to run a polity. Um, so um, I worry that that Pink's response will collapse into hierarchy. But to sort of bring it all back together, yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly the case that Catholics are entitled to think they're associated duties to the church. The question is, how does that transfer? Um, how does that transfer work? Um, so, yeah, this is one reason I chose the associated ones. I, I thought there was something that would be said for it. So. Sorry, I just have one more question. So, if, if integralism does not allow coercion of non Catholics, unbaptized non Catholics, unbaptized non Catholics, Sorry. which is still most Americans, right? No, most Americans are baptized, but they're not Catholic. Oh, so, they would actually be under, um, they would actually all be under the authority of an American so, liberal state. So, maybe the answer to what calls is that it's, it's, it's a majority. But yeah. if, they're, if they're not allowed to coerce a group that doesn't include you know, their flock, yeah. what's the difference between that and separatism? Unless, it, except it's maybe coercion of Protestants. Is that <laughs> um, so, the idea is that the integralists would run the state. So, it's not separatism coerce. because they would be in charge. But they wouldn't religiously coerce. So, what would be what would they replace liberalism with for everybody else, if not religious coercion? So, for everybody else, um, there would be a kind of common good politics based on natural law, where the grounds would be that reason can see that there are certain kinds of acts, abortion, euthanasia, genetic engineering, capital punishment, maybe um, um, same-sex relationships, same-sex sex acts, um, uh, uh, birth use of birth control. On their view, reason can detect um, that all of these things are impermissible, and so it'd be, impermiss it'd be permissible for a state uh, to ban all of those things, pornography as well. Um, as also blasphemy against God, they also uh, would include. Um, so society would be governed generally by a kind of uh, a theory of promoting the natural law, and the common, enforcing the natural law, and promoting the common good. Um, and for those who are baptized, then they would come under the particular revealed authority of the church, so Jews would, you know, that were unbaptized anyway, um, would have a right to religious liberty. Their liberties in other respects would be restricted, um, but um, in ways that, you know, many, many of us would say, wow, that's a lot of restrictions. Um, so, but that's the idea, is to say, look, everybody is, um, ha is bound by the natural law by reason itself, okay? But the baptized would, would be under kind of a special legal arrangement. Now, that's not infeasible. Many, many Islamic regimes had for a long time institutionalized uh, special authority for Muslims in a variety of respects, um, even, though other, even, even though there's a series of rights that are regarded as universally held. Um, so, you know, they're, essentially what you would have is second-class citizenship. You would kind of have the people that, whose view was established and preferred and the groups that were not. And we have reason to believe that such states will tend to be bad for the well-being and human rights of the people who are on the outs. Um, so that's what I predict would happen. Uh, so the natural law concept is doing most of the work that it's sort of... Um, in terms of the, what the law would be for everyone. <laughs> in terms of what the law would be for everyone, yes. I mean, one of the things the integralists are very keen on is banning all pornography. This is one of their immediate policy platforms, um, is to ban all pornography. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole big natural law piece to this, which they say by reason applies to all. Anyone through the use of reason can see it. Um, but if you're baptized, you're under a whole nother set of uh, 
of restrictions. So of course, you have to emphasize baptism also brings uh, certain certain kind of uh, certain kind of benefit. And getting to your actually speaking to your minor point briefly, I mean thinking thinking about this a great deal because um, I actually have been reading about um, why some Catholics went with fascism and why some did not. Um, and depending on the country, it's, it's extreme. It's, it is extremely interesting. So yeah, I don't want to say that Western European politics was a completely secular affair in the 20th century. That would just be false. So if I gave that impression, I think probably I did give that impression, um, but I don't. I don't think that that's true. I think even after World War II, it wasn't true. Um, but um, I would, I would say it is largely true now for most Western European countries. And yet there are nice counterexamples to this. Poland is a counterexample. Hungary is something that is held up as a counterexample. Uh, it doesn't seem to be sort of broadly religious, though, um, say in the way you might see in Poland. Nonetheless, there have been deeply committed Catholic uh, uh, political organizations uh, all throughout the 20th century in Western Europe. So I just want to make that clear. We have time for one more question, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna ask. Okay, good, <laughs> good, good. So this is this is about the. It's not so much about your argument, which I yep. find uh, convincing. Yeah. But it's about the integralists. Um, the integralists' critique of liberalism. Good, which you've mentioned. So one hears, or I hear, um, from the online yeah. integralists, who are the only ones I know. I don't know. Yep, yep. I don't know. Yep. Um, He's this, great. <laughs> I, I, I think he must be better. But yes. um, one hears from some, <laughs> from some famous integralists, uh, very online integralists, the, yeah. the ideas that, you've, uh, that you alluded to, that in, in liberalism, autonomy is the only value. Yeah. The only duties that one has are duties that to which one has as consented, consented yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, now it strikes, it seems to me that that's a caricature of liberalism. Oh, yeah, it's not even true about Mill. <laughs> it's certainly not true about Mill. Yeah. <laughs> and Benin doesn't know Mill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't even have tokens. Yeah. <laughs> that, but that said, there's something to it that is mm -hmm. that is they can point to the state of affairs in the u.s as they do say, as they do mm -hmm. and i i certainly am le i'm less confident in my ability to answer a kind of um it isn't just an accident that we slid down a slope to yes, where we good. are kind of argument then that this is you know, a theoretical uh, commitment of, yeah. of liberalism or something like that. So, I, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, of course, Deneen has this story that the error was baked in from the start. And of course, this goes back to a previous generation of Catholic thinkers who thought that uh, the horror was baked in not just from Protestantism, but from poor old William of Ockham's nominalism. Um, you know, so there's this whole declinist narrative that many Catholics have have um, pushed. Well, Brad Gregory's Unintended Reformation is a, a, a more recent attempt to tell this uh, story. Um, so there's this declinist narrative. And the question is, you know, all these kind of ills of modernity coming from getting certain ideas wrong. So Rich, the, the big influential book here is Richard Weaver's Why Ideas, uh, ideas Have Consequences, um, um, where he makes a similar sort of de you know, decline from you give up nature's, you know, you give up all this other stuff. So. Um, and many Catholics today will just sort of like start at the progressive era. Say like, well, something that happened like in the late 19th century, and then that's what messed everything up. And then Deneen just wants to say, well, something bad happened with Locke, you know, and so on. And then that's how everything got messed up. I don't like any of these narratives because I think there are too many other things driving ideas, but I, I have too many other factors driving history other than this sort of ideological transformation that seems like it's unstoppable in some respect. Um, know how nominalism is supposed to anyway but what's true in it what seems right about it what seems right about it is this and this is something robbie george no integralist has said he said because he's a he's a philosopher at princeton a very well-known conservative he said in the 70s 80s and 90s all my colleagues were that were liberals were telling me that liberalism was neutral that they weren't going to try to take sides that they were going to respect religion um you know the Rawls students all told me this 
And then when the cultural left got into its ascendancy, they didn't do that. What you saw instead was, for instance, the Obamacare contraception mandate, which was widely seen as an attack on fundamental religious freedoms of, in particular, the, the organization of nuns, the Little Sisters of the Poor. That was a very important flashpoint. That, the, actually, the details of the case are extremely complicated. Um, it's not as uh, simple as anyone thinks that it is. But nonetheless, um, it was between these kind of attempts, say with Obama's language talking for a little while about freedom of worship rather than freedom of religion, which a lot of people were thinking, oh, this is a truncation you know, of what religious freedom is supposed to be. Um, and so you saw these kind of moves. Um, and then you started to see, in particular, an increasingly aggressive attempt um, to uh, uh, impose a certain kind of sex or gender ideology um, that has uh, grown to a roar in the last five years, in particular. Um, so why did that happen, right? Why did that happen? Why did it go from liberals who were on the left saying, look, we don't want to persecute religion. We want to tolerate religion. We just don't like what the religious right is trying to do. We like Martin Luther King. We're fine with some religion and politics. That's fine. It's just we don't like this particular agenda. What we want is the state to be. What happened? What happened? Um, this is unsatisfying. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but uh, what I think is probably the case, what I think happened is um, that a lot of what's going on is a result of falling trust and rising polarization. But there are many people, young people on the left, that seem so ideological and ferocious because they simply don't know anyone on the other side. And they've never had a conversation with people that have the other view. And so they can't even imagine that the other view would be reasonable because they just don't understand it. They couldn't even tell you the basis of Christianity. I mean, over the last 10 years that I've taught philosophy of religion, Two years ago is the last time I taught it. And for the first time, a student asked me who Satan was. And what you're starting to see are these kind of bubbles where people just don't know the basics. They can't even imagine why someone would object to same-sex marriage. In fact, for younger people, that's just been their reality because for some, you know, a Obergefell is not something they even remember. Right? They can't even comprehend because they're in bubbles. They're isolated. They don't really know how the people reason about these things. There's also, I think, a sense of falling trust where the thought is that like, you know, even in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you say, well, the other people mean well, they're really wrong-headed, but they mean well. And under those conditions where you trust people, you might say, yeah, the state shouldn't try to take sides because they're people of goodwill. They're just, boy, are they wrong, right? But in a society where you think the other side is prepared to do anything to get power, I think it's really, really difficult to want to tolerate them because you don't trust them. Um, you think they don't mean well. They think you do wish them ill will. So part of the story, and this is why I started getting interested in trust and polarization, was that I actually thought um, in the U.S. this is this phenomenon are actually um, driving a lot of attitudes. And so I think what happens is when, you know, trust in others falls and when polarization rises, it starts to look like, well, look, it's, it's kill or be killed. So let's go for the best thing. Why would we... Why would we settle for anything less? They're going to do exactly what they want to do. But I think this is mistrust talking. And I think the sources of mistrust and polarization are much debated among scholars. And one of my next projects after this book is to doing empirical work to try to make some progress on what on earth is this kind of American. Uh, most, I think, uh, Amer it's the US universities that are driving a lot of this, even in Western, even in Western Europe. I mean, even the transgender debate here is so different than it is in the UK, um, right? Where there's a much broader range of opinion allowed for even in the UK than there is in US universities. Um, so yeah, I would attribute a lot of what's going on to um, distrust, polarization, and bubble type phenomenon um, where the people on the left um, that have this kind of holy warrior kind of status I tend to find are people that they just don't know anyone on the other side, and they just don't understand what the other side actually thinks. Um, if they did, maybe they wouldn't moderate. Maybe they're so deeply committed. But I still think contact with people that are different with you from you can be pretty powerful. 
Um, and so I think a big part of what we need is actual interaction between people who are different, politically different from each other. That's why it's important to have institutions like this, just so people can actually encounter what someone else thinks, even if it's really different <laughs> than, than what most people think. Um, so I would say a lot of this is a result of following trust rising polarization. They will say, oh, these are happening because liberalism atomized people and all of this stuff. And then I'm happy to have that conversation because actually the Scandinavian countries are the most socially trusting. And people say, oh, it's all because of ethnic homogeneity. I've responses to that. But uh, it's an interesting and scientifically important. We can talk, right? So, but I think, yeah, trust and polarization play a big role. I've gone on too long, but um, I'm very yeah. grateful. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking all the others.